I'm going to ask a question. What did you do this morning? I'm assuming you got up, you got dressed, probably had a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, had a shower, had breakfast, and came out to church. I guess it was probably very ordinary. How's your week been? Has your week been ordinary? Going through the motions of life, making sure that things are ticking over. For us, it's been quite an ordinary week. Amanda's been to work. Colin's been to look after the children. For me, not quite so ordinary as yet again I've had COVID, hopefully over the worst of it. I am tested negative, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But it's a regular pattern. It's the ordinary. It's the mundane that we've been going through. And I imagine perhaps today you're thinking, well, it's just another Sunday. I've come to church to sing some songs, to meet with my, fr- my, my family, to, to hear a talk, to have some coffee, to have a chat and go home and go on my ordinary day. But what if God wants to show up and do something in our midst? God wants to break up the ordinary. Often, we will find ourselves on the threshold of meeting with God in so many different ways, but we're too blind to see it. God is wanting to intervene in the ordinary, intervene in the mundane, intervene in our lives, but we're just too busy going about the ordinary things, making sure, the, I mean, they're important, but the bills are paid, there's food on the table, etc., There are, however, times when God really wants to get our attention. Ways that he turns up that we cannot ignore. Exodus 3 is one of those times. We see Moses going about his ordinary day. When we left Moses last week, he was in Pharaoh's house. He was was growing up in Pharaoh's house. And then he had to flee because he'd murdered, uh, murdered someone. And he ended up in Midian. Now we find Jethro, his father-in-law. So we know that he's now met somebody, he's now married, and he has a father-in-law. And he's doing something very ordinary. He is tending the sheep, shepherding the flock. He's on the far side of the wilderness. So it's not a quick journey home. He's probably going to be out on his own for a while. Sinai is not a desert like the Sahara or a Californian wilderness. It is dry. It is arid. And a shepherd has to know where to take the sheep to get the water. So this is a position we find Moses in. An ordinary day tending the sheep. And then something catches his eye. Something a bit unusual, you might say. There is a bush on fire. I suppose that might not be unusual. You know, we have wildfires. What's going on? But what is unusual about this is that the bush is not being destroyed. I'm not going to spend this morning exploring how a bush might catch fire and not be destroyed because that would take away from the point of this, of this scripture. But what we need to take from that is that it catches Moses' attention. Moses is distracted from his ordinary because he is on the threshold of a meeting with God. He goes to the bush. He finds himself encountering God. And then we get to the dialogue of the encounter he has. We find that God invites Moses to come near. But to be careful about coming near. Don't come close, but not too close. It's not merely a chance encounter of Moses and God at this bush. It's not, it's not by chance. It is so that a message can be relayed to Moses. It is God himself who is speaking, which shows the very significance of this particular chapter in Moses' story and ultimately in Israel's story. So we must ask ourselves a question. What does Moses know of God at this point? We've not been told in in Exodus. We don't know how much Moses knows about God at at this particular time. But God says, I am the God of your father. So we learn that God has been involved with Moses' family already. It then becomes clear that Moses is part of a genealogy back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, that places the significance of this encounter into its context. 
that God has now taken note of the suffering of his people and God is going to come down to them and act. That is what we're seeing. It's linking it all together with, the, with Genesis. And as we know, beyond, because this is the start of something that will ultimately lead to the Passover when Moses leads God's people out of Egypt. It's, it's more than simply identifying Moses as part of God's plan. This is about identifying Moses for bringing deliverance to the Israelites to get them out of captivity in Egypt. It shows us that God cares for his people, that God cares for his creation, and that his people are a way of bringing blessing to that creation. But to do this, they have to get out of Egypt. And God needs to fulfill the promise that he would give them Canaan. That's the promise that's been given. Yet, the Israelites are in slavery. Moses has fled because he's a murderer. How on earth is this going to happen? You're going to go to Pharaoh. Well, surely Moses must have thought, but if I go back, I'm going to be arrested or killed. And Canaan, the promised land, well, that's full of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. How are we going to go in there, Lord? But the cry of God's people has reached him. Moses, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is a call to someone who we don't know what he knows about God. We can imagine, we can work things out and, and, and speculate, but we don't know. But I wonder, now this is a little bit far-fetched, but this would be like God saying to us, one of us this morning, right, it's not quite, it doesn't quite work this analogy, but right, I want you to go to Putin and tell him to get out of Ukraine. That's the level we're at in many ways. Now, I know we're not Russian Ukrainian, but it doesn't quite work. But that's the absurdity of what Moses is being asked to do. In verse 11, Moses then echoes that and goes, Who am I that I need to go to Egypt? I'm going to Pharaoh. What do you want about God? I think if God said to me, Tim, you need to go up to Vladimir Putin and tell him to get out of Ukraine, I'd be like, What? When I meet those called to ordination, often the first question we have to wrestle with is who am I that you are calling me? Who am I that God is calling me into ministry and to, be, to, to preach his word, to be a representative of the church? And I think at this point it's worth saying that we need to reclaim that word vocation from just ordained ministry because every Christian has a vocation. But if anyone, when I ask that question, who are you that you are called? If anyone goes, well, yes, that is my vocation. I need to be in ministry. Uh-uh, straight away. Because it's not about what we are doing. It's about what God is doing. And how does God want to use us? It's not about us going, I want to do this. The encounter at this burning bush sets up the rest of the narrative of Israel's life. The narrative of the plagues that are going to come, which will eventually soften Pharaoh's heart so that he lets the Israelites go. It will then, before he changes his mind, and, they end up, and Moses splits the sea, and they go through, and the sea then comes over them. And then they wander around the wilderness for 40 years before Moses gets to see the promised land but doesn't get into the promised land, which is really unfair. And then Joshua, and we know the story goes on from there. It sets up this whole story. It sets in motion the story that will eventually end up in the Passover, which is what Jesus will then resemble when he goes to the cross and he becomes the ultimate sacrifice for us. God calls us into something often that sounds so complicated and removed, is so far removed from what we could ever possibly do. Indeed, before I was ordained, when I was still working in law, I'd have said, you don't be daft. There's no way that I can be in ministry. There is no way that I can stand up in front of people and preach God's word to them. I'd quite happily stand up in, in a courtroom and speak to a judge and argue a case. It was so absurd. For most candidates, their journey towards ordination begins when they sense a calling from God. 
Perhaps that is like, sometimes like a moment like the burning bush, which comes on an ordinary day at work or at home or on the train. But for others, it's a longer journey that's been weighed up a long, for a long time before they go, you know what? God is calling me to something. I've got to start looking into this. I don't imagine it's going to be like that old National Lottery advert with the big hand, it's you. I don't think it's like that. It doesn't work like that. God will do something, though, to get our attention. And when he does, our chances are we're going to go, what? And that's why I like Moses' reply. And I think it's really helpful for us in 2024. Because when God asks us to do something, we usually go, well, who am I to do this? Who am I? I'm not able to do what you're asking of me, God. So I want to ask you this morning, what is it that you think is so absurd that God is asking you and you're going, but who am I? Who am I that you want me to do this, God? Because he will be speaking to each and every one of us. He has a plan for each and every one of us. And those plans will probably sound quite absurd. But when they sound so out there and so big, that's how we know they're from God. Perhaps your response is going to be like Jonah, to run the opposite direction and try and avoid the call. Or maybe you're wrestling with the question, but is he really calling me? I've never heard any. I don't know what God's asking of me. But that, that is a good place to be, to wrestle with God. What is it you want me to do? And I love it when Moses goes, really, me? And God just replies to Moses, well, I will be with you. I imagine that God is saying that in a really caring, fatherly sort of way. You can, he will see Moses, what? And God's going, it's okay. I will be with you. You've got this. I'm with you. And that, friends, is exactly what God is saying to us in 2024. You got this. I'm with you. Whatever it is I'm calling you to do, whatever it is I'm asking you to do, I'm with you. You can do it. God says to Moses then that there will be a sign that they will come and worship God on the mountain. And the conversation continues in what I can only think is a normal conversation. Because Moses goes, well, okay, I go. What happens then? How do I prove that you've spoken to me and told me to do this? I am who I am. If I go back to my own vocational journey and the point where it was suggested that I see the DDO, there was a real sense for me of going, but how do I tell people that I'm exploring ordination because it's so out there? The hardest part for me was telling my mum and stepdad that I was being called away from law. It felt like it was such a change that I'm suddenly going to leave this career with power, with money, with prestige to go into ministry. But there was a sense of when God wants you to do something, it just doesn't go away. So I want to ask you this morning, what is it that you're sensing God is saying to you that you keep perhaps putting off, that keeps coming back time and time again? Because God will keep on working in you until you go, okay, God, it's time. I'm going to do what you're actually asking me. I wonder in these verses, whether that's what Moses was thinking. He was trying to reason with God. Now, of course, that is me reading into the text, and I accept that. But it is one of the standard texts that we ask people to explore when looking at their vocation, in whether that's ordained ministry or anything else. Because what we explore as we look at Moses in these, in these verses is the idea of the reluctant leader. It's the idea of someone who thinks, but... I can't lead, but it gives us that sense of awe and wonder and amazement about what a vocational calling from the Lord is all about. As I've said, we use that term calling and vocation in the Church of England for ordained ministry, but it's so much wider than that. We're doing it a disservice because every single one of us has a calling from God to do something. We just need to discover what it is. And actually, what we discover when we start to explore calling is that there are always similarities in the way that God will speak. Firstly, God will initiate the contact. Moses was not on a quest to find God. He was out in the wilderness tending the sheep. 
Normally, a calling starts when it's in mundane and ordinary. And that shows the humanity behind all the narratives in Scripture where there is a calling. Often when God calls someone, it's in that entirely ordinary moment. It's not the big spiritual highs of a big conference or even at church. It may be in the washing up at home, in the mundane, in the ordinary. It may be in the walk this afternoon as you go out with family. It could be when you're stuck in a traffic jam tomorrow on your way to work. It's in the mundane and the ordinary is often when God speaks. In the Moses narrative, he's tending his sheep. But what it shows us is that God is not worried about people's resumes or experience. He is not worried about what you have done so far. God is worried, well, he's not worried, but God is interested and invested in you for who you are. And that is the important thing to to look at. The famous quote, you know, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So if you are sat there going, but who am I to do this? That's okay because God is going to say to you, but I will give you what you need to be able to accomplish what I'm asking you. God is calling people out of ordinary circumstances for extraordinary tasks. And I would long to see more of that in the church today. To see us rise up and do what God is asking us to do. Because then I think we'll start to see the nation begin to change once again. And perhaps hearts turn back to the Lord. Often, thirdly, the people are jolted by the thought of what God has in store for them. The first response is one of humility or disbelief. There's that feeling of inadequacy or reluctance. And that's perfectly normal. It shows the humanity of people like Moses going, who am I? It shows that. And it shows that we can then relate to him in our day when we go, who am I to do what you're asking of me, God? We often see that repeated questioning, the denial, the pleading. But that is healthy because it's in those struggles of what God is asking us to do and the questioning behind the call that actually begins preparing us for the very task that God is asking of us. If I go back to my work as an ADDO in the diocese, the selection process for ministry is not quick. It cannot be quick. It's not a case of one meeting, it's a tick, off you go to selection. The whole process is about discovering who we are in God and what God is calling us to do. Those that push things through quickly are the ones that never get through. And I think that speaks volumes. Because when they're pushing it through, it's their own agenda and not God's. In those times of discovery, we learn so much more about ourselves and we learn so much more about God. But often we don't want to spend time in that wrestling place. We want the answers handed to us on a plate. But I want to say this morning, try spending a bit of time in that place of wrestling. Because that is where we discover who we truly are and where we discover who God is as well. And fourthly, the lesson learned is that God is greater than our inadequacies, our lack of experience, or our talent. Ultimately, what we see is that God will call to something that is so unlikely, that is so outside of our comfort zones, that we simply have to rely on his power and his might at work in us to achieve what is being asked. God meets us where we are. God knows where we are. And that is the take home for today. We begin in awe. We then question. We wonder if God's made a mistake And actually, as an aside, that puts us nicely in the world of the Psalms. Because it's like, what's going on? What's going on? And as a result, we grow slowly, but surely. And we get a better understanding of the role that God has called us to in his kingdom. God will call us into his kingdom firstly. And then he will call us into kingdom service. At this stage in Exodus, we don't know how this is going to play out. We don't know how Moses will be received if he goes back to Egypt. We don't know how Moses will be received when he walks into Pharaoh's house and says, let my people go. But in 2024, what if that thing that sounds so totally unobtainable is what God is asking of you today? How is that journey going to begin? And where is that journey going to end?
After all, Moses encounters God at a burning bush, and he'll be remembered forever as someone who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, who split the sea, and who led them in the wilderness. So what God is asking you today, imagine what that's going to look like in 10, 20, 40 years from now. What will we will achieve if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and follow the call that's been placed on our lives? It's a hard place to go to because it means total and complete surrender to God. It means that we have to place all of our trust in him <coughs> excuse me, and allow him to use us in the way that he wants. It's what we see Moses do. Are we going to be like Moses and follow what God is asking us to do? My question then that I leave you with is what is stopping you? Amen.